very very important thing. We wouldn't be together with for Taylor Larimore. He's not here with us. I don't know if he's going to tune in or whether Rich will get him on one of his videos. Uh, but Taylor, we wish you the best. We constantly hope to be able to get yourself together and get back here another year. But a lot of what I'm saying is dedicated to you and the inspiration that you gave me. Uh, that said, um, I want to start off by saying we're talking a little bit about books. Uh, with the great Bill Bernstein, Dr. Bernstein here this morning. And uh, he did something that was kind of mean-spirited. Uh, <laughs> the book Bogle on Mutual Funds has been the number one book on uh, Amazon since the day it was published seven and a half years ago. And it continues to be the number one book today. It's amazing. I don't know any other book in any category that has that sustained kind of leadership uh, for seven and a half going on eight years. Applause. So that's common sense. It's a little book that oh, it's the one that does so well. That's number two, by the way. <laughs> uh, so if Amazon is a good guide, that means it's good as any. Uh, a, lot, a lot of volume comes on there. Probably 40% of the books sold in America, maybe 50. But it's a pretty good test. And obviously, I'm pleased with that. But Bill Dornham brings out uh, a book on retirement. Are You Ready? I think it's called. It's a great book. It's a short book. He gives it away. He's number one. <laughs> don't, don't do that to me. You're not a mini vanguard there, man. <laughs> Cutting costs all over the place. But in any event, I think everybody that exists now owns Bill's book. So I can come back to number one again. Uh, I do want to concede that on the mutual fund list at Amazon is not in the same genre as, say, Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> <laughs> now you shouldn't have read that. <laughs> you must know what's in it when you're laughing. <laughs> but in any event, uh, it's been great to see those books do so well. And they're three of my books are the most wished for books on Amazon. And uh, still selling, uh, I think it ranked in all books, you know, obviously not number one, but maybe number 2,500 or 3,000. And they have, I think it's five million books on Amazon. So it's, it's pretty good. And it's an awful lot of fun uh, to have done that. And to have it work out so very well with the acceptance of shareholders. Uh, there are two more books coming out, even though I promised my wife, I probably told you earlier, I wouldn't write anymore. These aren't real books, but we're going to give you, in view of your loyalty to being here today, we're going to give you copies of each of them. Um, and they're out there, but we don't want you to have them now, you should all be reading them. <laughs> and uh, one is a very short, more, more of a pamphlet than a book, called The Man in the Arena. And it's, it's a transcript of a... Uh, of a follow-up to the Legacy Forum that they had for me, 60-year Legacy Party they had for me at the Museum of Finance in New York. And uh, we had four really distinguished people who took a day off, uh, basically, to come to New York and uh, talk about me. It seems kind of amazing to me. I'm sure it seems kind of amazing to you. Uh, it was Alan Blinder, professor from Princeton, head of the, the Economic Studies Center for Economic Policy Studies, professor there for many years, uh, former head of the Vice Chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, frequent contributor to the Wall Street Journal, regular contributor to the Wall Street Journal. We had Cliff Asnes, a hedge fund manager, probably the biggest group of hedge funds in America, who had a, uh, a little side story. He, he tells this story in, in The Man in the Arena in this transcript. He says he has a license plate on his car that says WWJD. And someone says, wait a minute, Cliff, aren't you like Jewish? What is, what is Jesus doing there? <laughs> and he said, no, it's not Jesus. What would Jack do? <laughs> <laughs> He's got a great sense of humor. Going on. <laughs> and the third one was Jim Grant, the editor of Grant's Interest Rate Reserve, a brilliant writer, not just about financial stuff, but about many other things. He's got a biography of John Adams, a biography of his Speaker of the House many, many years ago. And uh, he was there, and his thing was about Bizarro Bogle. And do you all, are you familiar with Bizarro? Anybody here? Oh, yeah. The 
Bizarro is the anti-Superman. They used to talk about him on Seinfeld, and I have never read, never watched Seinfeld, but um, he's, he's the exact opposite of who he's supposed to be. So uh, Jim Grant's thing is a little riff on me, and being following a different career for different reasons. And my career is such that my son decided, my career is a hedge fund manager, bizarro, the opposite of what I do, and it was superseded. My son then thought, you know, that's not the right way to run a business, so my son started the first index fund. <laughs> and his last line was something like, whatever the case, it's all about the money. Uh, and, and the final one was Dick Silla, a professor of, uh, of finance and, and basic corporate history at NYU. And he compared me with, I hate to tell you this, but it's silly, but it's nice with uh, Alexander Hamilton. And I think I came off well in the comparison. I don't care. <laughs> but uh, that's in the man in the arena. And then it looks like this. And thanks to Mike Nolan, my wonderful assistant, who's here somewhere over there. And we self-published, you know, selfies. <laughs> well, this is a selfie. <laughs> a, uh, I just decided I'd like to put this in kind of between the covers of um, the article I have in the New Journal of Portfolio Management called Lightning Strikes. This remarkable coincidence of in two weeks, in late September, early October of 1974, starting Vanguard, Paul Samuelson's article, the very first edition 40 years ago of Journal of Portfolio Management, saying, would somebody please start an index fund? And the bottom of the bear market. All that happened very quickly and set the stage for this new company. So that is in there. Turns out I've also written 13 essays. I printed them also in here. Uh, and uh, so you can read what I was thinking in the past and then for shoot. And then two of them are voted the most outstanding articles, the outstanding articles of JPM in two particular years. And if you get that awesome a treat, uh, you're asked to write a retrospective five years later, essentially. So there are two retrospectives on how the ideas have won these prizes. And one, interestingly enough, the very JPM is a very, very quantitative magazine. And yet, of all those 13 articles, really 12, because this one hadn't been reviewed yet, and the new one, Lightning Strikes, um, all these quants were the ones into the subscribers to JPM were the ones who picked my least quantitative works. That's good. One was called Do Sherry Duty, No Man Can Serve Two Masters. And the other one was called uh, something. Yeah. <laughs> you get what you pay for or something. Oh, there's an idea so important that you can't think about anything else. And that was the title of it. And it's about the cost of the financial system. And then without a lot of big data in there and a lot of complicated formulas, those were the two they selected. And then I printed also the Samuels in the original article. And uh, one more nice letter from Paul Samuels to me on my 80th birthday. And that's about it. But that's in the book. And that looks like this. And uh, I thought you'd be interested in the dedication, um, which I thought about doing a little bit late, just the last minute. And uh, I think I'll read this. It's not very long. said ideas are a dime a dozen, but implementation is everything. Well, this book is focused on the ideas that inspired the creation of both Vanguard and the Index Fund. This dedication honors those, quote, honest to God, down to earth human beings, you've heard that expression before, who implemented those disruptive innovations. And those who inspire our crew to take the place of clients and first. So a hearty salute to those who serve in our Vanguard crew. Those who are responsible for the hard, often thankless task of getting a day's work done. Extraordinarily nice people who do their work with loyalty to our family values and commitment to serve our shareholders. And a second hearty salute to those whom we at Vanguard, as trustees and fiduciaries, are pledged to serve, placing their interests first and foremost, so 20 million families who have entrusted their wealth to our care. We teach them as well as learn from them, notably from 
230,000 bobleheads, the core of one of the most active financial web websites in the land. That's the dedication, so it's to you, and we will have that for you later on. Um, Self-published, and therefore instead of taking six months, when should you get this to the thread, Mike? Friday. <laughs> <laughs> Is this a great country or what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, just short from Taylor, uh, can I interrupt and just yeah. read uh, the message from Taylor? It says, Dear Mel, in March 2000, you and I organized the first Bowhead Conference of 21 investors in my Miami condominium, <coughs> where Mr. Bogle honored us with his presence. We never imagined that 14 years later, you would be chairing a conference approximately 10 times larger and forced to limit attendance. Participating in Jack's noble crusade to give ordinary investors a fair shake has brought meaning and enrichment to our lives. I'm sure it will do the same for every Bogo head who has made the journey to this year's conference. I send my affection to each of you, and especially to my dear friend and mentor, Jack Bogle. Signed, Taylor. Well, that's very nice. It's a nice response. The best. So what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about a little bit personal side of things, a little bit about Vanguard's history. And I want to do that first because my deck of slides may run a little long, and that may have to take a short trip for one of those that those uh, slides will be available to anybody here that wants them. Maybe take two or three hours to get them to something like that. <laughs> but uh, the title I picked was uh, entitled for, for all of it together, <coughs> human beings and algorithms. Vanguard's as Vanguard's 41st year begins. So going back to the beginning, uh, the title of the introduction, I'm really drawing heavily from the introduction to the book now, uh, is entitled "It Was the Best of Times, It Was the Worst of Times." Always a good idea to throw Dickens in there. <laughs> and uh, so, as September 1974 drew to a close. October began. It was a fortuitous moment in financial history that was taking place. A new star, not in a big star sense, but just one more entry in the universe, and entered the mutual fund department. A company that had just come into existence, incorporated on September 24, 1974. It had a unique, you know this, truly mutual structure, owned by its fund shareholders and operated on that basis. And it was called, of course, Vanguard. A week later, on October 1st, the first issue of the Journal of Portfolio Management was published under the leadership of founding editor Peter Bernstein. One of the major papers in that issue was entitled Challenge to Judgment by Professor Paul Samuelson of MIT, America's first Nobel laureate in economic science. You could find no brute evidence, as he called it, that any mutual fund manager had consistently earned returns that separated, that surpassed, the returns of the unmanaged S&P 500, and basically demanded somebody somewhere start an index class. In retrospect, his essay, powerfully echoed by early 1951 rudimentary statistical research and my Princeton thesis that reached a similar conclusion, uh, I witnessed further, much more important than that, my own personal experience had witnessed, I'd witnessed firsthand the abject even catastrophic failure of the new breed of professional fund managers following the collapse of the Gogo era back in the mid 1960s. A terrible chapter in this industry's history. Together, his inspiration and my experience, his being Dr. Samuelson, shaped my decision to create the first world's first index. It would be a logical basis for an investment strategy that follows from and would be fully consistent with Vanguard's business structure. Strategy follows structure, as I said so many times. Just consistent. Two days later, October 3rd, the third fortuitous event took place. The long since counterintuitive, the end of a long, harrowing band bear market, 50% decline, and from the early 1973 high. Very few managers and funds anticipated that decline, and many funds declined a lot more than that 50%. The fund industry had failed the investors who had trusted its money managers. And fund assets would decline almost fatally 
by 40%, 53 billion to 31 billion, and uh, only bailed out later on by the money market business. An amazing story. So in that two weeks, uh, the moment for a new structure, a new strategy for a failed industry was at hand. Amazing. Times were bleak. Yes, the opportunity was deeply hidden. Uh, if, it, if to some people totally invisible, and yes, the industry was in crisis. The rest is history, recounted in the essays that are in this book here. The new entity managed 1.4 billion of other people's money, OPM in October 74, and four decades later, in October 14, 2014, it's now three trillion dollars of other people's money, the largest fund enterprise in the world, and more than a trillion dollars larger than its uh, closest peer. The Financial Analyst Journal is also celebrating, of course, its 40th anniversary. They published 13 of my papers, and uh, I republished them all of this in this anthology. And it turns out, I make this a brief here, there is three, three very different phases of focus in these papers. The first phase, 1990-1994, was establishing reasonable expectations for stock market returns in the coming decade. I continue to use that to this day. It's proved to be pretty good. And dividend yield, initial dividend yield, plus subsequent earnings growth, plus, plus or minus short-term speculative return as market values change, PEs go up and down. Put them together and they get to be the total return on the market. I'll talk a bit more about that and show you the data later on. Second phase, 1992 to 2002, oh, I didn't plan and the papers that I wrote during that period focused on the investment performance of actively managed mutual funds compared to passively managed index funds. And I guess I was getting a little more confident about the index fund in the early 1990s. And here I focused on the relationship with returns and risks and the powerful role of played by all things cost. Then in this third phase, the most interesting phase, the focus of my interest shifted again. Veered sharply away from data on stock market returns, on mutual fund returns, to the counterproductive structure of the mutual fund industry in, in particular, and in general, to the appropriate role of the U.S. financial system in modern society. I wrote four papers on these matters in my life and strike, as I think I mentioned, I did mention, um, two of them became quite popular. Why did I change? Why did I change my focus? I don't know the answer to that, of course. But I say in the book, it's perhaps my growing idealism, which is still unshakable. And certainly it must have helped that I was now free from the rights and responsibilities of running Vanguard. And my uh, readiness, as always, even eagerness to speak out from my self-created bully pulpit. And if this talk is too solipsistic, a realization that if I didn't do it, there were few, if any, others who would take up the cudgels of reform. Lord knows there is much room for reform in our system. Our nation's underfunded retirement plans, our industry's failure to give individual investors a fair shake, the conflicts of interest that permeate and inhibit the appropriate regulation and legislation for financial sector, the reluctance of our money manager agents, that's what they are, who collectively hold voting control between 70% of all the American corporations, the stockholder of American corporations, um, to use that power in dealing with, among other unpleasant issues, excessive debt, executive compensation, loose accounting practices, and undisclosed political contributions, each issue reflecting the need for a federal standard fiduciary duty for all those responsible for OPM. And uh, in short, there's enough work to demand that I continue to speak out from that bully pulpit for the next two decades, or three, or four, <laughs> or more. And I don't usually look back, I don't think most financial writers do, uh, at my works uh, in retrospect. But because two of these won the financial best, best article uh, awards from JPM, they ask you to do this five years later. Uh, after you've written your article, take a look at what it looks like. Every five years, these winners are asked to present 
a retrospective on their winning papers. And uh, they, this, this little document published every five years. Uh, so, well, uh, so I did that with the speeches that I wrote, outstanding articles in 2008, and again in 2009. Now, that first retrospective, early in 2009, was on a 2008 paper at the time, though. So I didn't really have a lot of time to think about it. A question so important, I finally got it right here, that it should be hard to think about anything else. It was included in the five-year cycle, 2004-2008, only a year before I was asked to write this essay. Uh, of the counterproductive uh, support, counterproductive actions or financial intermediaries. It had already, within a year, garnered very broad high level support. I'm not sure that this was all inspired by me, but it happened to come almost immediately. A major article in the New York Times, an essay by Simon Johnson, former chief economist of the International Monetary Fund, and Buttonwood, the incisive columnist of The Economist of London. And that's all, you know, terrific people adopting this idea of the, the, the role of our financial system in subtracting value from the returns investors get in its own behalf. Uh, I uh, concluded in that retrospective and expressing my pleasure, the escalating, rent-seeking, even rent-gouging by our financial intermediaries, never one to waste an adjective, uh, <laughs> had been recognized, initiating as I wrote the title course, an idea whose time had come. And uh, you see this in the documents I'll show you later on. Uh, not enough, but it's beginning. And in 20, 2014, just this year, I was asked to write another retrospective on my award-winning 2009 essay, The Fiduciary Principle, A Man Can Serve Two Masters. Here the tables were turned uh, because I had fully five years to consider the impact of what I'd written. And uh, in retrospect, what I liked about that paper was the most naked presentation of my na native idealism that I've ever dared to write, focus as it was on the need for integrity, principle, and ethical responsibility in finance in a phrase fiduciary duty. And particularly, I was proud, I hope it's okay to be proud, uh, citing similar wisdom from some of the greatest men in financial history. Adam Smith, can't beat that, John Maynard Keynes, and Ben Graham, and of course, U.S. Supreme Court Justice Harlan Biss Stone, whose 1934 essay, The Public Influence of the War, provided both the inspiration and foundation for that paper. Yes, as he wrote in that essay, writing in 1934, there is nothing more vital in our own day that those who act as fiduciaries should be held to those standards of scrupulous fidelity which our society has the right to demand as it does. That was true in 1934. It was true in 2009 when I wrote that article. It is still true in 2014, and it will be true forevermore. Now, there's a lot more in here, but I guess I could say there, there has been yet another shift, partial shift, I had a busy day and I'm trying to get a lot done. And I do want to say thanks to Michael, who was an unbelievable help to me. Just Michael and me and Emily, and she'll be here later. You won't know her. She's been here before. My amanuensis, I think that's the right word. Look it up. Um, <laughs> and uh, she will be here. And the three of us, plus Sarah, who's in part time, uh, crank out this huge volume of work. So I'd like to publicly express my thanks to you, Michael, for doing such a fantastic job. He's been with Vanguard around 13 or 14 years, and he's been for three and a half, and I couldn't do it without him. A lot about it. Kevin is out here somewhere. My long-lasting, probably long-suffering, are you here, Kevin? Somewhere back there? Uh, yeah, there's Kevin. Kevin Lawson. I couldn't have done it without him in those days. So, uh, these guys have really made my I like a lot more fun, a lot more enjoyable, and they're unbelievable in their follow-up. They're playing the computer like Paderewski. <laughs> the, uh, I just couldn't do anything without them, really. So, one another shift that I'm spending a lot of time with our crew. Uh, I do with crew teams will come into my office. You know, they can ask me in advance. 
and there may be seven or eight of them. We have to bring in extra chairs, but it's not that big. We can hold, I guess, ten if you are willing to stand. And we'll come in and just talk, and they'll ask me things from now on. And you know, one day, it's ten crew members, the longest serving of whom had been here since 19, uh, 2013. The longest serving. <laughs> and I say, who has the gall, the temerity, to ask for a meeting with me? <laughs> and then I, I did one of the luncheon with uh, five ladies who had been there for an average of 20, 26 years. A group that works together. And they're all fun. They're all enjoyable. Uh, and, uh, and they can talk about anything they want. Uh, I talk to the teams. I talk to retire parties when I'm asked. I always say, and the same thing is true, the Award for Excellence winners. I talk for an hour and a half to each of them. And I talk to anniversaries. And someone has a 20th anniversary or something. And I always say, when I'm getting invited, I will come if the coast is clear, if you know what I mean. And I don't use the plus hour management for getting in their way. But I usually end up back saying, I know what you mean, yes, the coast is clear. <laughs> so I show up. <laughs> And uh, I'll just, I don't want to waste a lot of time, but the human side of business has become so important to me as this company gets bigger and bigger. I'm going to talk a little bit about that now. But two recent ones were really amazingly interesting, totally different. Uh, one was a 25 year anniversary, along with a man who was going to retire, who was retiring at, at, after 20 years with us. They were on the night shift, they were the tech guys to keep our machinery working all night. A thankless job, and, but great people. They were, and I, I got up there, went over to the Stefano Center, made that long walk to the back, and the long walk around a long corridor. I had to take the elevator to get upstairs at this stage in my life. And uh, there were these probably 25 people, and it looked like the United Nations. Old, young, black, white, Chinese, Indian, Latino, Everyone wants to see male, woman, male, female. And it was a great, great evening in which they took, I said, I haven't had this many pictures taken since my wedding. <laughs> <laughs> Including the now popular Some selfies. selfies. <laughs> <laughs> and they seemed to love to do the selfies. And it was just a wonderful evening. And I got a note back from the retiree saying, I think he used the phrase big shot. No big shot from Vanguard has ever come to see us before. And I think that's awful. And I was happy to fill the gap and to make the, uh, more than happy, ecstatic. I could hardly sleep that night. I was so excited about it. And uh, particularly, this is a little sidebar, particularly since my wife does not like me to be going late. I have a time when I'm supposed to arrive home in the afternoon, which means getting out of the office at 4 and getting home at 4.30. Uh, resting a little bit, sometimes even taking a nap. And she doesn't want me working so hard. And she doesn't want me working at night. She doesn't want me not being there for dinner. <laughs> so, and she's right, by the way, in all camps. As you know. And, and uh, she said, what a great thing to do. She understood the difference between, you know, a lot of other things I could be doing. You know, some dinner for big shots and pull it out or something like that, which I just don't do anymore. And the other one was for 20, 26 year retiree, who just wanted to have a couple of people stop by. She had three pizza pies, and we were all going to have just a bite of pizza. She didn't want a celebration, didn't want anything, but wanted me to come. So, of course, Bogle being Bogle, I showed up, and there a few people were sitting around having a pizza pie. She was a lovely woman, and she said something that broke my heart. You made it possible for me to retire early with her retirement plan in Vanguard. And I said, oh boy, that's a mixed emotion. You know, so I'm getting rid of you because I, <laughs> we're losing you because we made it easy to leave. <laughs> that's what we call a paradox. Uh, and uh, so I started to talk a little bit about these things, 25 year things. I often tease them by telling them, I'm sure they remember it because I used to speak at every billion dollar advance we made and every 10 billion. And I said, Susan, I know you'll remember some of these speeches. And it's amazing, the speeches all those years ago, I'm not, not embarrassed about it at all. It's a great consistency of theme. Uh, and I just read a couple of things out of the books and kid around about a little thing. In her case, she came to us with her assets were 
45 billion. So I thank her for the remaining two trillion nine hundred and fifty-five billion. <laughs> <laughs> and I started to talk, and I guess I had kind of a loud voice. And this was just like all over cubicles of people answering the phone and that kind of thing. And the next thing I look around, like five minutes into my talk, very, very informal. It's like a flash mob. <laughs> there must have been 120 people there. How this thing happened, I don't know. You just can't have better days than I have. Being with the people that do all the hard work. Um, so, uh, I remind, it gives me a chance to remind our crew of our corporate values, our corporate structure, our corporate history, our investment strategy. And I try and explain to them the story of Vanguard. I want, I want to know how hard it was at the beginning. We had a trillion, four billion. God, I still can't get it right. A billion four of assets at the beginning. And our shareholders were so impressed that they took out $400 billion for the first three years. <laughs> <laughs> There's a vote of confidence for you. I capped off my article in Forbes magazine talking about the new uh, separate organizations of Wellington and Vanguard. And it was entitled, you'll notice it right out of Romeo and Juliet, a plague on both your houses. <laughs> and they did apologize, but I damned if I know why it took them 23 years to do it. <laughs> That's a long time to wait. And I'm a patient fellow. <laughs> I make sure to live that long. But it's a story of contrarian opinion, uh, opportunity deeply hidden, introspection about an industry that was losing its way. I guess some courage and stubbornness had to be there. In, the stu in so many ways, the story of that serving you notice again, honest to God, down to earth, human beings with their own hopes and fears and financial goals. It's a story of trusting and being trusted and realizing through all that great fog that we see today with money values, there is in fact remain issues that are white or black, right or wrong. And I say, don't compromise. Uh, never been good compromising. I guess there may be a time for it, but never compromise. One of our directors used to say that. Never compromise on matters of principle. I didn't spend a lot of time, I don't think, 40 years ago, wondering about whether or not I'd be around to celebrate our 40th anniversary. Obviously, not everybody lives much beyond 85, and the odds are not improved when you've been beset by profound cardiac challenges that began 14 years before Vanguard was even born. When it began, I must have been wearing blinders to ignore the odds. Uh, Entrepreneurs, it said, are as risk averse, averse as everyone else. The fundamental characteristic of entrepreneurs risk seeking is self confidence. Entrepreneurs may recognize, probably do, that starting a business is risky. They just believe their innate skills will win out. A third of all entrepreneurs, according to a survey, thought there was no chance, zero chance, they would fail. Looking back over my own decisions in the early years, I think it's a very perceptive observation. I guess you could say I just don't scare very easily. Yes, some great ideas, structure and strategy uh, are central to our ability to change the world of investing for the better. It's very clear that's what we've done. But I yet repeat, as I say in the beginning of my uh, in the previous introduction, ideas were a dime a dozen, but implementation is any, is everything. So I'm shameless about taking every opportunity to be with our crew members and continue to provide what leadership I can, the commitment they provide, the leadership, the commitment for loyalty, the professional skills and the human values that have been essential and remain essential to Vanguard's success and whatever further success we might achieve before we celebrate our 50th anniversary and God willing our 100th, which I also expect to be around for. <laughs> And then maybe I'll be satisfied with Wellington Funds having its 88th anniversary this year. So maybe I'll be there for it soon. Who knows? Uh, but these crew members are our legacy. And they are the keepers of our value. Leadership at the top really can't keep those values. You can try and reinforce them. But it all comes from the people who are working day after day together. So there's been great joy in my life, as you can probably tell, uh, in these past 40 years. I love the joy of the battle. Uh, I love working on the firing line uh, with the crew, those who do the hard work, thankless work, often thankless certainly, of serving our clients and owners. 
and I get such joy every day of going to our, over to our galley for lunch, waving to our crew, chatting with them, meeting with them on so many fine teams that I mentioned, large and small, and visiting on their anniversaries and so on. Um, so, um, let's say a couple more things before we get to the whistle. Um, the days fly on. Of course, I age. I recognize I don't really feel it. He says, well, maybe I feel it, but not in my mind. Uh, I recognize the time will come when I won't be able to engage in the mission that I set for myself to continue to speak out for truth and integrity and character in the world of finance, striving to build, I really do, a better word for investors, not just Vanguard investors, but honest to God, down to earth, you've heard this before, and I repeat it again, human beings who deserve a fair shake. One strength to carry on, alas, does not, cannot, go on forever. In my case, the spirit is more willing than ever, but the flesh weakens. So, for me, the human beings who have been part of my long career, including all of you, including our Vanguard crew, and have been by far its most important aspect, particularly in these most recent years. I'm not sure I was this considerate of everybody, very arbitrary, capricious, high-handed, dictatorial. Uh, when Vanguard started, I thought I had to be. That's my nature anyway. <laughs> but uh, I've, I've learned a lot about dealing with human beings. And I've often said, I like human beings better than algorithms. <laughs> and I like judgment better than process. Not the our size today, mixed blessing. We don't require an awful lot of algorithms and an awful lot of process. Neither has ever been my strong point. In its early years, we were young, beleaguered, scorned. But by the mid-80s, we developed the momentum. It's continued ever since, built on the same pillars of our economic strategy, power and structure. So, in this rapidly changing world, um, how many firms can say that? They're doing the same thing they've been doing for 40 years, and it still works. Especially in those early years, my success was by no means assured, as I told you. My highest problem, priorities, were the need to be optimistic every day, no matter how many reverses there were. Set the standards for commitment. I basically had to be the longest working person there, I had to be the first one in morning, and the last one out at night, and I wasn't probably not quite the first, but I was usually in the office at 6.30 and left at 6.30. No, that didn't mean I didn't work at all. <laughs> it's 6.30 in the morning and 6.30 at night, uh, but um, to communicate openly and to give the crew the strength to carry on. Turn about is fair play, and today it is our crew and all of you at Bogleheads were giving me the strength to carry on. The tables have been turned. These have not, these recent years, have not been the easiest for me, surprisingly. But I carry on with your confidence, our crew's confidence, your collectively with the crew, your respect, your admiration, and as some crew members have put it, maybe you too, your love. How could a life possibly be more rewarding? I quoted this song in my 63rd, late, 63rd anniversary in business, beginning with Wellington, uh, earlier in, in summer, I guess, which was the day of July 9th, yeah, my 63rd anniversary of work. And uh, I concluded with a nice little song. Sometimes in our lives we all have pain, we all have sorrow. But if we are wise, we know that there is always tomorrow. Lean on me when you're not strong. Lean on me and I'll be your friend. I'll carry on. I'll carry on. Uh, and uh, I don't know at the end of that, but you know the song. Lean on me and I know I lean on you. So it's been, it's been a fabulous time. Um, I am very reflective of it. I'll lean and until I'm going to need somebody to lean on. So, <laughs> uh, so thanks, Bogleheads. Uh, I lean on you, and you lean on me, and uh, it's been a very rewarding part of life. Uh, the main thing I've tried to do, uh, as I quote in, in 
they had that document. Uh, the main thing I'm trying to do since we were founded in 1974 is to create a working environment and an investment environment based on integrity and service and ethical values. A place where each of us, after Abraham and Lincoln, first inaugural, each of us are touched by the better angels of our nature. So that concludes my rather lengthy remarks before we even get to the deck of slides, which Michael will help me with. So we'll just pause for a minute. Maybe we should take maybe a five-minute break and we'll get these slides together. Is that okay, Mike? Sure. Okay, let's just, just sit, relax here. And <laughs>